Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining our virtual roundtable, Overcoming the Cloud Hurdles in Game Devs. Uh, we have an amazing panel today. Uh, but before we introduce all our experts, I'd like to speak a little bit about our housekeeping, which should be really short. Uh, so we're all here on Zoom. This is going to be uh, a conversation amongst experts as a panel. Um, no slides, nothing else. Um, and everyone will be in mute. But we would encourage you to post questions throughout the entire webinar as much as you can. And we will for sure get to those questions. And whatever we don't, uh, we'll be happy to follow up with you. So with that, I'd like to introduce our expert panel. But I don't want to do it myself. I'm going to let each of you guys introduce yourselves. Um, but let's do it in this way. If you can, state your name your responsibility, uh, the company you work for, and what is your favorite childhood video game? Now, let me start just to get the ball rolling. My name is Yochai West. I uh, lead product marketing at Incredibled. Incredibled is an acceleration uh, platform for gaming for many years now. Hopefully, you are well familiar with what we do. And my favorite childhood game is Contra. That dates me. I don't know if you guys remember that. but Thank you, Konami, for instilling in my brain, yet to this day, the Konami code. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, BA, select, start. I don't know why I remember that. I'm 42 years old, and I still remember the cheat code that, uh, that uh, got you unlimited shooting power in, in uh, Contra. So maybe that's uh, sort of childhood memories right there. So that's me. Uh, let me turn it over to my... Um, Colleague Israel Ragoza, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your favorite childhood video game? Hi everyone, my name is uh, Israel Ragoza. Mm -hmm. I'm a product manager at Incredibuild, responsible for our uh, cloud solution. Um, I was more into sports simulation games such as uh, Championship Manager. I'm happy to be here today and share my experience. All right, who's up next? Avida, you got something? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Avita Misho. I am the lead engineer for uh, the core tech team at Proletariat. We are a game studio that has uh, released Spellbreak last year. And let's see, my favorite childhood video game. I did spend a lot of time on the Atari 2600 mm -hmm. and specifically Pitfall when I realized you could jump oh. on the alligators' heads. That was magical and amazing. It's a very simple game, but <laughs> spent a lot of time on it. Classic. All right, so the right to my screen, at least Brad, maybe you can take us uh, to the next. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, Brad Hart, I'm CTO at Perforce, where I run uh, product management and sales engineering for a number of products, including Helix Core, which if you're on this call today, you probably use. Um, you know, excited to be here. Child, favorite childhood uh, video game. Thank you. I was going to say Pitfall on Atari. Uh, but so now I'll go to my backup, which has been the Mortal Kombat series since the original stand-up arcade. Uh, and I still buy every single one that comes out. So uh, happy to be here. And do you do you do movies as well, or you don't go that far? Does that just taint your 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 childhood oh, the movies, memories? Of... The movies are cheesy, but great for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right, Kevin. Right. Uh, my name is uh, Kevin Ashman. I'm a partner solutions architect uh, working at AWS Game Tech, so the area of AWS that focuses on the games industry. Um, and I, my childhood memory, the magic um, was Duck Hunt, actually. I really wanted to understand how that was done when I first saw that, uh, which has kind of led me in my career to how we can build great things and give that delight to, you know, current generations. So they have their own memories. Fabulous. And last but not least, uh, Mark. Hello everybody, my name is Mark, Mark Petit. I run the engine business uh, here at Epic Games. Uh, and so, you know, we sell the engine to games company, to the games, but we're extending the use of the engine with young games, film and TV, uh, and in all kind of industry, architecture, automotive, and uh, training and simulation. So that's that's what I do. And uh, I I do remember uh, Tetris on my Game Boy and spent way too many hours on this. It was magnetic. I was dreaming bricks uh, 
at the yeah. time. And so that's that's my childhood memory with games. I was not really a child, but because in my childhood, you know, I had to go to a bar to play games in France, and I was not allowed to do this. So. Okay, all right. Excellent. So thank you everyone for that. And I think what's great about this um, this panel is is really the the different angles of the our overall ecosystem uh, that uh, what makes uh, the game dev industry uh, so exciting. Uh, and hopefully those I think the angles and perspectives will come out through our conversations. Um, so let's let's begin. And I'd like to start with uh, sort of a speed question. Um, it's like one of those what comes to mind. Uh, when you think of the following. And before we go into the hurdles and the challenges and how we are all together looking to solve these challenges, uh, when we think about just the benefits of moving to the cloud, of cloud game dev, uh, what is the first thing sort of that pops up into your mind as, it, as a value? Uh, so Brad, why don't you go first? I would say access, right? Global access, uh, certainly predating the pandemic, um, a lot of our customers were looking at uh, the cloud as a way to simplify infrastructure and provide access for their end users. And the, one, the ones that were ahead of it certainly benefited. Um, but yeah, so just access and scalability and accessibility. Excellent. Kevin, what are your thoughts? I think we have a, an opportunity to redefine what productive means um, for game developers uh, that can give flexibility to their work environments, but really it's about the accelerators for game dev that the cloud offers, which is uh, part of what this panel is all about. Awesome. Uh, Israel, what are your thoughts on, what is the most thing that pops into your mind when you hear about the, uh, the benefits of moving to the cloud? Um, <clears throat> I have many years in, uh, in R and D and talking with, uh, with incredibly cloud customers. And uh, I think the most, Thing about the cloud is you have a peak times, you have a few times over the year that you need more compute power. It could be a regression cycle, it could be a hotfix or something like that. And you need to run more builds, more testing, make sure that everything is okay and all the tests are running smooth. And, and the ability to get infinite compute capacity in a second, just when you need it at the right time, and then delete those machines like, like nothing happened. This is the, the great benefit of the cloud. All right, Mark, anything uh, from your end? Well, I think we, we, we come off a long, you know, a year that showed us that, uh, you know, distributed teams can work. And I think the cloud is a fundamental, you know, it's the empowerment of distributed teams. And I think we're learning of, uh, you know, the pros and cons distributed team, but there's a lot of pros. I think the future of a content creation game development is about more about small connected teams that you know, big buildings full of cubicles, full of people, you know, because the, as Kevin said, productivity, the ability to recruit everywhere around the planet. Uh, hopefully we get to harness those, this, this workflow in this lifetime and, and this into a better work-life cycle balance as well, elimination of commute and stuff, you know, and more, you know, hopefully a better, a more creative and more productive environment. Excellent. Uh, Avita, bring us home. <laughs> Um, I think earlier last year, I think my, my first answer would be uh, improved disaster recovery because everybody was in the office and, you know, all our machines are on premise um, and that could break. Uh, I think now I would definitely say scalability. I would agree with everything my colleagues have said here. Um, we have a lot of our uh, engineers now in different states. So, you know, being able to use CDN like, you know, systems where it's it's less of a downtime, no VPN saturation, things like that is just a really big deal. Great. Okay, so now that we have sort of the values, um, hopefully you guys in the audience um, can echo that. If there's something that possibly uh, we didn't mention that uh, you guys um, have uh, also, we'd love be happy for you to share that with us. But now let's go into, it sounds great. Uh, obviously there are hurdles um, and that's what we're all coming as, as an industry, uh, as an ecosystem to try to uh, together work towards uh, making uh, what seems like an amazing idea uh, a reality. 
Um, and we're going to talk about, you know, specifically, uh, you know, development in the cloud. Uh, the world of streaming cloud is a whole other world. Uh, maybe at the time, at the at the end, if we have some more time, we can uh, shoot some ideas around that as well. But let's start with the the actual hurdles themselves, the challenges. And what I like to do is I like to do the same kind of thing, go around the room, the virtual room, uh, and talk. Uh, if you can each talk to maybe uh, now a challenge, and um, then we'll talk a little bit about what um, what each of us in our domain see as sort of the way that we can overcome that. And we'll run a poll to also see how that reflects really the people who are online today uh, and reflect as a, as on that as well. So let's start with Kevin this time. Uh, let's talk about the cloud dev challenges that you see from customers when speaking to customers mostly. Uh, perfect, thanks. Um... Following up on uh, Mark's comments uh, real quick about um, how things have changed, I, I noticed in the GDC state of game industry um, um, report that came out, 66% of respondents actually said that their productivity and creativity stayed the same or increased. So I thought that was a really nice data point on what Mark was pointing out that really does set the stage for where some developers have focused on that expansion into the cloud for the development like Avita is sharing. So I think that sets a really good stage and um, under underscores the point that I would make is the the challenge is is actually how and what you want to use the cloud for um, at, at, at game tech AWS game tech we actually feel it's it's across the full life cycle of the game. Um, we can talk about the accelerators for development. Um, the build infrastructures that perforce and Incredibuild are a part of. But even Israel, when he mentioned some of those points in time that were uh, very critical to use the cloud, included, you know, essentially like issues in the field um, where players are having bugs and you have a regression. You need to get all in and test that. So we see that the cloud is actually it plays a role in the full life cycle of a game, from not just building, but also running that game, operating that game, and growing that game success after it launches. Um, and specifically with like Incredibuild and Perforce, it can definitely, the, those products can change the paradigm on how mm -hmm. studios develop. Uh, but I wanted to point out two different ways I feel that it's important. Uh, individuals can, can build faster um, and, and figuring out how to do that is the challenge. And that's where the cloud comes in. The second is the full CI CD pipeline. So the the challenge that that I really see is is a as an as a company that game studio where they choose to um, to bring the cloud into their their game production. We're talking about very clear um, posi positions in like game infrastructure or cloud infrastructure for for builds and CI/CD. But how does it how does it accelerate throughout the entire life cycle? Excellent. Yeah, thank you for bringing up the, the point about GDC. That was a good report. And um, um, maybe take uh, Brad, if you'd like to take us uh, to your challenge? Yeah, so one of the challenges that I see um, with our customers is, you know, the notion of going to the cloud. And, the, you know, we all know the benefits are obvious, right? Um, and we've been talking about them. But it's not just duplicating your existing topology and doing it in the cloud. Right, because you're not leveraging the cloud native capabilities, you're gonna get sticker shock, right? If you duplicate your existing model and try to burst it out and have no uh, control or access mechanisms um, to, to manage that. So really where we've seen people, you know, face that challenge is how to design the topology in the cloud that makes sense for the pipeline they're trying to build. Where can they leverage the strengths? Um, and, you know, what is the right model? Is it, is it a little bit of a hybrid model? Um, and just kind of navigating those waters for, you know, the large AAA studios is one thing. And then some of sort of these mid-tier studios that are really trying to figure it all out. And they haven't been running their pipelines for very long, maybe a year or less. Um, and really trying to navigate those waters is a challenge. Um, and that's why we've been working with the folks at, Am at, at Amazon um, and, and uh, the other providers to help you know, set up best practices and help guide these folks through, you know, this new topology that they're they're creating. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, uh, Israel. What are your thoughts on uh, the challenges that you see uh, from the industry? Do you echo that, or things that are unique that you can mention? 
Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm echoing Kevin and Brett, and I think that uh, we hear a lot uh, from our customers. They want to go to the cloud, they understand the benefits of the cloud, but they are really afraid of the cost. They're afraid of, you know, if, if this is an on-premise, you buy the server, you buy the license, and that's it, the electricity and all of that. It's really hard to manage. But when we're talking about cloud, um, you know, this provision of machines, there, you need to learn how it works and what is the cost and the different types of machine and if, what is spot and all of that. And this is something that I hear a lot from our customers. They want to do the transition. They're really afraid of the cost. I hear that as well, and and that might also sort of define the 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 um, how big the studio is. Um, uh, larger organizations um, or might be already sort of thinking in one direction versus maybe the smaller studios. Um, it's an also interesting thing to see in the range. Um, what about Mark? What do you see from the Unreal Engine side? Um, challenges around game tools, maybe in the uh, in the you know, of course, I mean, we need those. I mean, when you use those cloud-based workstation and you see, you know, because this, this is server class hardware. So like if you do a, you know, if you do a perforce sync on a server class hardware, it's not the same that doing a perforce sync from home using your home internet connection. And so that right there, you have a lot of productivity, but the price of those, you know, virtual workstations, the, you know, we need, we need cloud GPUs we need to see the commoditization culture. It will happen. It's just you know, need to ride the cost curve and uh, and and again, you know, I, I do agree there is some angst about putting all your eggs in you know in a cloud provider's basket when it comes to cost and it's it's all viable cost and you know what happens if you burst through things and you know how you teach your folks about how to do things. You know, a fixed infrastructure is a good way to control. So I think we all need to learn that. But I think it's very clear that. Uh, you know, prices prices starting to go down, and we all learn. You know, the hybrid model, how to to learn. It's I think it's 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 really the big hurdle is the learning, and people have to be willing to experiment. And we see various type of experimentation. We see customers building entire new companies, hundred percent cloud based. They just don't even think about buying a computer. And you know, that's that's great. We've seen you know in our own game studio for Fortnite. You know, it was a lot of resistance initially to use virtual workstations, but then people got to it and, uh, you know, where it works, you know, and it's economically viable. So it's, it's, the, it's the learning process and to have everybody confident, make some experience. I mean, you, you have to dip your toe in the water and give, give it a go. And we run full applications like the Meta Human Creator now uh, on the cloud. And those applications will only be available on the cloud because, you know, they're machine learning based, require a lot of data. That would be the single biggest install of software you ever seen in your life and so it's it's the way of the clearly the way of the future yeah yeah first of all kudos on the meta human that is a one impressive uh tool and it's amazing to see the different uh, creative um things that are going out from music videos to uh to anything else that uh, comes along um so yeah that is mark that is the first cloud-based tool that is a major one that's put out by uh by epic yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it's the first of a new generation of applications, you know, using both machine learning, games mechanics, and real-time graphics, you know, to 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 offer a new way to create content. Um, Amazing. I've also been very successful migrating all of our learning activities to the cloud so that people can learn the engine without owning an engine-capable machine. And so, you know, working with AWS, working with our friends at Parsec, a bunch of other people, um, you know, we've We've empowered all of our training partners to do virtual classroom. It's a lot of benefits because, of course, there's it's all virtual, so it can happen from home. You don't need the hardware, and then you can have more teacher learner interaction because you know on, on the same virtual machine and stuff. So again, it's you know we were we felt that you know not traveling was a catastrophe from a training perspective. It turns out it, it will turn out to be a huge opportunity to do learning differently and more cost effectively. And our only problem now is time zone management. Right. Excellent. So uh, I'm sure, uh, Avita, you have plenty to say, but I'm going to hold off just for a moment and give you a chance to sort of tell your journey. Uh, afterwards, we can reflect. Uh, but I like to first run the poll uh, to see um, folks who are on the line give you a chance to uh, interact with us. So what is the biggest hurdle in moving your dev and CI/CD uh, process into the cloud? So we have your cost, 
uh, which we've reflected on security, which uh, isn't one that I think we mentioned at the moment. Um, prioritization uh, for some organizations who are looking to uh, um, to do so many things at the moment. Um, maybe it's really important they understand the the value of it, but uh, they're not there yet, and possibly not even seeing the benefit. I uh, have to put it out there. So those who are on, we'd love to see. Um, uh, you guys giving uh, some of the um, your thoughts, and we'll reflect on that in a moment. We'll give it just one minute for you guys to uh, go ahead and choose it for you. All right, let's see. Keep them coming, guys. When do we see the results? Okay, excellent. Um, where, where do I see the results? Ready? Excellent. And here we go. So cost, right? Cost at right point, we see 47%. Security, 13%. Prioritization, 30%. And we don't see the benefit, 10%. Interesting. Um, let's, can we all, re let's reflect on this for a moment. Um, cost. Um, what would you guys say about cost? It was this, this was the, I think the one that we noticed um, was going to be something uh, that would be sort of one of these hurdles. Um, security. What do you guys say about security? Um, Kevin, Brad, you guys hear anything about security being um, uh, an issue? And while we're talking about, you know, reflecting about these issues, what what do you guys see as as a solution to that possibly whether it be <clears throat> something that's out there today uh, experiences that you've had from your customers uh who've overcome possibly one of these hurdles um and maybe even something that is in future uh, on your sort of roadmap that can help any of these sort of hurdles whether it was expressed in the poll or uh that uh, we've spoken about it before so once you kevin once you start us off with uh <clears throat> what are the, some of the things that can help customers overcome these hurdle, hurdles? Sure. Um, and starting with security, uh, as you've kind of teed up, um, security is what we call job zero at AWS. Uh, that's an inherent to everything that we build. Um, if the AWS cloud is not secure, then pretty much nothing else matters. So it's it's really it's an opportunity to educate um, the the game studios in general of of how secure AWS Cloud can be in protecting a game studio's IP. This is absolutely critical uh, for studios. It's it's the passion projects. It's it's all of the 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 blood, sweat, and tears of the teams being released somewhere else instead of uh, a traditional on-prem. So it takes trust. Um, and at AWS, we try to earn that trust. Instead, because AWS takes on the additional sec security requirements of the physical security of the servers, right? I've never seen data center, never gone into them. I have no way I'll ever see because there's no reason for me to be in there. So it's more secure to keep people out. So it, there's a really great opportunity to talk about security uh, in general for AWS services, but specifically for for the for the games industry CI/CD pipelines. I mean, we're talking about build artifacts, right? That's a game build. Those are those can't get out, right? And so it's important that studios um, and the attendees here feel that security is one of the top the top issues to discuss. Um, what I'd say is that's that's where AWS steps in. Uh, it really enables a lot of security controls. We we have a lot of certifications um, for uh, for many different security bodies, and really the the idea of le least privilege. Basically, those build artifacts. You have a way in AWS to limit who can see that. Um, and you'd rather we we recommend in our best practices people get an access denied much more frequently than they would get, you know something that that opens the access too much. Um, so a lot of great best practices actually leveraged from other industries uh, can be brought into a CICD pipeline. But if but if possible, I'd like to you know also talk about the topic, a couple other things while I have the mic. Uh, one is about cost. Um, absolutely cost 
is, is part of it. If we think of the CICD pipeline in general, um, other industries have, have had these type of pipelines and workloads um, shift from on-prem into uh, you know, an AWS infrastructure. And on average, there's actually a 31% uh, reduction in that infrastructure spend. Uh, and part of it is because you move from a capital expenditure or like a, a upfront investment into an on-demand um, cost basis, right? So you're, you're only paying for what you use, which is very important. And the last thing I'd say real quick on cost is when we think about CICD pipelines about this question or even more broadly uh, with, uh, with game production, costs should be looked at from the perspective of uh, you know, what, what those costs um, line up with, which include a smaller game studio uh, physically, right? Less space, lower rent, lower utility bills. Um, shifting all of those costs into, you know, removing, I should say, the upfront infrastructure spending. So that's a, a bit a, about the cost. Um, and those are, those, are, those are topics that make sense to discuss. Um, and I won't dig into the last, but like, don't see the benefit. That's the one that, 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 I, that caught my attention. Um, but that's what this, is, this session's all about. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, Israel, do you wanna talk a little bit about um one of those challenges and what can be done to help those. Um, <clears throat> I'm really echoing Kevin. And I think that uh, eventually the cloud um, is the better solution. Uh, there are many tools um, to, to reduce the cost. I can say that um, beside the acceleration platform, um, which Incredibuild is the most famous uh, in the cloud, we're putting a lot of effort to reduce the cost. It could be the spot instances that can um, really dramatically reduce the cost. It could be when and where to shut down the machine so you can enjoy the entire benefit of the cloud, but not getting the bill too much higher. Um, you know, the, 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 the ability to dynamically create the machine and turn the machine down uh, with using the pay-as-you-go model is extremely uh, optimized for using the cloud. And, and from the other perspective of the security, um, there are many services that AWS offer to, to protect your code. Uh, even at Incredibuild, we put a lot of effort to make sure that your code is protected and no one can touch the cloud machine and permissions and roles and so on. Um, I think in overall, if we took also Incredibuild and AWS aside, the cloud offers a really good security level of uh, um, uh, of the things that you need to make sure. Right, and and I think everything that we're even talking about um, really is uh, very similar to almost any cloud transformation across on, on any other industry. Right, it's not just in a former life I was in the contact center world, and when we were bringing the contact center to the cloud, you know, you had uh, financial institutions where it said, uh uh you know, how, how can we bring that, uh, you know, to the security, security wise and everything else. And, and that has since then become the standard uh, for uh, just under, understanding the ultimate benefits of being able to scale quickly, peak seasons, you know, it's very similar in almost every industry. We have got, you know, the, the, the pre-holidays crunch time, um, they have the same thing um, in, in that industry as well. Um, so I think, you know, talking a little about the challenges, I like to sort of ground this conversation in, in sort of the, the reality, which is our friend Avida, um, who maybe Avida, you can tell us about your journey, um, the things that you experienced as, uh, you know, as many studios out there, which, you know, whether you were or weren't thinking about the cloud, all of a sudden COVID coming in and becoming that accelerator. I think it's Deloitte that uh, called this actually the year of the acceleration. Um, things that you possibly you thought about doing, it was on your list, but then that thing hits and you you kind of have to go with it. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about what it was to a uh, release spell break amidst the 19. I can't even imagine. I mean, crunch time is hard enough. I can't even imagine what that would be during COVID. Uh, so please take us through your journey uh, and reflect on everything that we talked about, the challenges um, and Ultimately, if you can leave us with some lessons learned for others who are out there, uh, what Proletaria did, um, and also leveraging this ecosystem, that'd be fabulous. Okay, great. Um, well, let's see. Before, before last year, 
um, the studio was primarily focused on releasing Spellbreak. It was all hands on deck. We released in September, uh, September 8th to be exact. And our only, our main experience with cloud was about our actual uh, runtime servers. So we have game servers and we have like application servers that do authentication and matchmaking and such. So those were our cloud uh, instances that we cared about. Um, and mind you, uh, Proletariat is very, is comparably is a smaller company to some others, but um, not terribly small, but it's still on the smaller side. Uh, what we had was everybody on-prem. We had a build farm with just four build nodes. Um, our Perforce server was on-prem, is on-prem, and our Jenkins, primary Jenkins is on-prem. So there was, everything was there. And all of a sudden we had to leave the office um, saturate our VPN all of a sudden because everybody was syncing to our Perforce server that was in the office uh, at the same time. And um, we realized that um, we had to do something. And my first focus was speeding up the engineers build time. So that's when I reached out to Incredible to discuss what are our cloud options. Uh, mind you, we didn't have Perforce in the cloud, so it was really difficult to go full cloud on that route. So we did uh, work with that um, incredible to set up a hybrid solution, which is basically our coordinator was on-prem, which has a very small footprint, and our instances were in the cloud. And part of the difficulty there was understanding how much of a pool I needed to allocate, like what what did I need to reserve? Spot wasn't available yet. And it was just, it was just uh, trial and error, right? And then the dashboards were helpful, but I wasn't clear how much, if it was the right allocation amount, what about the timeouts, you know, cause the spin up times were slow. Uh, so I increased the timeouts. And so it, it's, it was just a little trial and error. The other part of that was that everybody's home ISPs were so different and their bandwidths were so different. I was on a, um, a gigabit so I had the luxury of like a, a better performing build using the cloud but we had engineers that were on 100 megabits and it was just it was not necessarily that much helpful right the iter the iterative compilation wasn't a big win and what I saw was that full clean like package builds and full clean like non-package builds were the winner there, um, mostly around shader compilations because we have a lot. Um, but the iterative, like changed a little one file compile wasn't necessarily, didn't need to happen. The engineers had enough cores locally. Um, so that was uh, an interesting challenge. We had to play around with agent settings for each individual engineer to see what made sense for them. Um, as far as the number of cores to use before it started to worry about um, hitting the cloud. Um, some engineers turned it off completely because they were just in middle America and it bandwidth was not good there. So I think that was uh, an interesting lesson. Uh, our build farm continues to use the on-premise though. It didn't make sense for us to move to the cloud for the build farm, especially because we need, that's the speed we need for our um, current, uh, package builds for our QA team. Um, let's see, the other lessons we've uh, probably just, everybody's discussed is we started to move Perforce to the cloud, uh, which was not necessarily um, a high priority before the pandemic or during our launch, but now that we've launched and we've been out for a while, uh, we realize that that's the right direction to go. So the difficulty with doing these kind of endeavors is that our engineering team is not necessarily have the expertise of doing um, DevOps or, or site reliability engineering. And so we had to learn as we go and every single one of uh, the panelists here are our vendors and we work very closely with them to uh, set up our infrastructure correctly. Um, so right now we're in the process of moving Perforce to the cloud. Uh, it is definitely faster for people who have switched over. So that is exciting. Um, there is some VPN shenanigans we have to do because we have to have our office VPN and um, the cloud one. And so there, there's, some, there's some DNS craziness happening there, but uh, we were able to overcome it. Mind you, this was a, 
probably at least a few months lead run time to get this going. I don't know if it was because of the expertise or because it was just one person working on it. When was the right time to move engineers over? There's never a good time. Um, and so I think we're just trying to do it piecemeal. The other part of our development uh, area that we were considering moving to the cloud was our CICD, our, our build farm. Um, that is a more challenging uh, task in the sense that we have you know, multi-platform, you know, PS4, PS5, Xbox, Switch, and all the SDKs we have to install. How do these servers work with them? They're different. They're Windows servers versus what we have on-prem. So we have to be cognizant of it. Can we make images? Do we use Dockers? Do we not? And there were so many options and the investigation time was huge, right? To, in order to do this and do it correctly, we spent a lot of time starting to investigate and you know, do comparisons, do we do a hybrid, do we do full cloud, what makes sense um, to move over. And in the end, because we're, we're such a small studio and our current on-premise build farm is not uh, having any trouble as far as putting out builds, it's mostly about build times, which on-prems at, at this point was is fast because our perforce is there as well. Um, we decided that the ROI was not important enough. Now, that being said, we did realize that it's important to allocate some time to try to get there in piecemeal. So for example, our primary Jenkins is on a non uh, out of box management <laughs> machine on the um, in our office, which actually went down uh, right before we uh, had to submit to certification for first party. And so I had to run into the office in the middle of the night in Boston um, to turn it on. <laughs> and so those things for us are critical. And what happens if that goes down? So that's an example of something we're really focusing on. Hey, let's try to move our primary Jenkins up to the cloud. Um, how is that going to work with the uh, nodes that have now, they will start using Perforce in the cloud. How is that going to affect their times? Um, and so these are just areas that we're considering. The other last area that we have to focus on is our archived um, builds. They were they are currently on an FTP in our office, and again, it's limited by space. You know, you have to deal with retention policies and such. Uh, what QA wants to save, and it, that's a no-brainer to move to S3. So we are definitely going to go in that direction very soon, and hopefully, it will help with um, download speeds for everybody, because um, that is also a pain point. So those are the big challenges that we face, and where we're kind of focusing right now. Um, I do want to mention that when we did a first test of just our Unreal Editor building in the cloud, it wasn't as fast as on-premise. Um, and I'm not sure, and we didn't get enough time to investigate. So I'm sure there are different areas we could optimize there. But again, this ties into the, what's the ROI? Do I put my build engineer on this because we don't have anybody else to work on it? Or does he work on more important things? So that's kind of, uh, where we're at right now. So this is why we're trying to do it in small pieces and make sure the priorities are correct. Yeah, thank you for sharing that with us, Avita. Um, Brad, Kevin, uh, Israel, do you guys have any sort of um, tips that you can say, uh, you can mention to both Avita and others who are uh, in their situation about, um, uh, you know, I think the concept of piecemeal uh, was something that we can take away from this. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for the most part, as an industry, um, you know, as we get more mature, trying to create this this best practice that we can also share uh, throughout is is important for us to do as an industry. You know, hearing this from Avida and others out there, and getting together, what does your stack look like? What is it recommended? You know, the piecemeal move versus you know, do you have your dev in the, in the cloud first, the CI, and so forth? Um, would love to hear your guys' um, sort of tips for Avida and others that are out there like her. That's okay. Uh, how well, about just, you, Brett? Yeah, I would just say, uh, uh, you know, a couple things that we've seen. I mean, one is as you try to move your infrastructure, we talk about security and all those, of those things, is trying to maintain that single source of truth, right? As you, as you enable more technologies, you know, whether it's cloud here and, 
different access points. What you want to avoid is silos, right? Where the data is being duplicated, you might have different security controls. Um, and we've seen people be successful with a plan. That's, you know, what we're all about at Perforce is a single source of truth uh, so that it makes it easier for your disaster recovery, security, all those kinds of things. Uh, some of the things where the concerns that people had uh, brought up and I've been monitoring the chats as well, you know, around, you know, cost and performance. So I would say reach out, right? Don't, don't, uh, even the large companies, people aren't just naturally experts in this, right? We are, we are learning together the best ways to deploy these topologies. And, you know, it's not a simple solution of we're just one stack, right? There's going to be hybrid models, mixed models, there's transition periods, call us, right? Work with your cloud partners, right? And we will work together. Like I said, we work, we work hand in hand with the cloud partners. Uh, you know, we were on calls with the, an email thread with Amazon today, right? Um, and it's about, uh, you know, really finding and customizing what the right solution is to, to leverage the, the native cloud capabilities. Uh, what we know will work in a hybrid mixed model um, to, to leverage those things. And then just for the future, we're looking at this, right? We're looking at from a Helix Core perspective, what can we do in our product on our server side to more natively leverage uh, cloud capabilities, right? To make it easier to set up, improve performance, reduce cost, help seed replicas easier and faster, working with the virtual desktop environments and best practices we've seen with, with customers uh, that have been very successful there. So all these things are top of mind, reducing costs, right? For some of these smaller studios, We've got the Indie Studio Pack, which is great from a Helix Core license perspective um, to get people started for free. But we're working with the cloud partners to say, hey, what can we do to reduce the overall cost of infrastructure to get people up and running quicker that are um, you know, just getting started? I look at the Epic model right, with the Unreal Engine and how they do their licensing. Um, it's very attractive for people getting started. right? It's very helpful to those businesses. Um, and so we're looking at ways that we can kind of leverage those similar kinds of concepts to lower the barrier to entry for people to do things the right way, right? And then, you know, as they enjoy success, we will all enjoy success as their technology partners. Yeah, and, and what's what's amazing about the industry is that, you know, more and more of the cloud infrastructure is built and sort of, you know, productized, uh, the more is the available sort of a, lowers the barrier of entry for some of these newcomers who are coming in sort of learning off of our either mistakes or best practices. Right. One thing that uh, Avita, you mentioned, which was interesting to me, was um, you know the concept of DevOps and SREs within the, the world of gaming. I mean, DevOps and SREs is, is within itself a uh, somewhat of a new concept that is, of course, you know, developing, but they're, uh, it's growing tremendously. And um, you know, I'm curious to see what, what that does to the gaming, you know, get game dev community. Do you guys see DevOps as like this big function yet in game dev, or is it still not there yet? I'm curious to know if you have any thoughts um, on that. Based on our um, search <laughs> for additional DevOps, <laughs> I would say it's not that common. Um, I worked at Wafer for a stint outside of gaming, and that was that was the primary group there. And I realized why and, um, you know, the live ops support, all that stuff. So I think that is fairly newer. I mean, I come from the time when we had to burn discs for our GMs and, you know, so when, when we go into like, you know, server side, it's all like, oh, okay. Now we have to worry about live games and supporting them. Um, I think for our, our challenges have been trying to find people that are uh, qualified enough that not necessarily gurus in AWS or GCP or anything like that, but can adapt and can learn really well. Um, it has been difficult to find people. Uh, I think DevOps is a very uh, is a very nebulous gray phrase that can mean a lot of different things. Some people think it's a build engineer. Some people think it's not. So. It, it's been hard to to understand it for gaming um, when we've been searching for folks. Um, in general, our our focus has been that they are in charge of uh, deployment, uh, all the cloud-based infrastructure, um, 
alarms, uh, cost analysis, that's a big one, right? Like understanding capacity and density planning for our servers uh, is a very, very big task. And that's hard. Not everybody loves to do that. So that's also part of it. So it's, it's definitely different uh, than what I've seen in gaming. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Kevin, just want to maybe reflect a little bit about, about what Avita said um, previously of your challenges and and what's you know what's next on the horizon uh, at uh, AWS Game Tech that can again help um, these folks um, ease their way in a better. Yeah, Avita made some very good points, and one of the underlying uh, pieces in there is about that experience in the games industry uh, on this subject matter and the individuals who have that experience uh, to be hired or to, to come in as studios need them. Um, uh, one of the things I'd say is that as, as studios look to advance their DevOps definition more broadly, as Avita was mentioning, um, it, it, is, it is an opportunity to look at other industries um, who have done this and, and kind of challenge the notion that the games industry is so different. Um, the demand patterns for game servers, very different than most other industries, absolutely. Build artifacts and QA and CICD pipelines, maybe not as different as, as we think of them, aside from, say, consoles. Consoles bring their own requirements, and, and, and that's, that's a separate topic. So, so one of the things that, that we at AWS like to do is, is put out enough information to help companies strategically look to invest in this space and, and mature into perhaps a cloud center of excellence where they they want to operate as a uh, as a as a company that leverages the cloud for some um, kind of you know if you will advantage um, in the industry. So so that that DevOps role has to increase. It's part of what uh, at Game Tech we're trying to define again. Going back to the game development pipeline is not just build and launch your game. It's all the way through the live services, like Avita mentioned. But seeing the operations of your game as a game goes through its life cycle uh, of of players playing it, the demand curve changes, the ROI expectations change. Right at first, you might be willing to invest more in the infrastructure, but then as maybe the game has had its, uh, you know, hopefully long enjoyment cycle, it will curve down. Uh, and you're looking at those cost optimizations, which may, may be more traditional and less game specific. Uh, so we wanna look at that whole life cycle of a game um, for, for game studios. And your other, your other question was about, you know, where, where do we feel that the AWS can help? Um, it's specifically um, sessions like this where we, you know, we have, you know, Unreal Engine as as a leading solution, and what are the best practices to bolt in Incredible, to bolt in Perforce. There's never going to be one architecture for everybody, but let's paint some really good pictures of architecture on on how this this can work for different types of studios, um, not just uh, architecture, but also solutions. We have AWS samples for Perforce um, to, to get up and running. We have um, AWS samples for virtual workstations where you can install and, and, and run Unreal Engine 4. So putting those pieces together um, is what, what we at AWS are, are looking to do. What is the future of an Unreal Engine you know, cloud studio for, for games look like? And you know, the, this group, uh, Unreal, has, has been super helpful in, in identifying that as one of the next steps. And Mark even mentioned that even the, the fellowship program, uh, the Unreal Fellowship Program, does do virtual works, uses virtual workstations for that and sees a benefit. So it's taking those learnings and making it more broadly useful for the industry. Yeah, yeah thanks for that, Kevin. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. From a cost perspective, I want to call out that it's not just, you know, in AWS concern, it's about us refactoring our software to be more efficient and fully take, you know, uh, take benefit of the cloud infrastructure. So we have to learn to do software differently. We have to take Linux more seriously because Linux servers are much cheaper in the cloud. So we are going through all those engineering cycles to be, you know, container friendly. And, and there's different way. I mean, we, we come from where we build pipelines with Pythons and scripts. You know, we have to learn containers, microservice architectures, and we kind of have to adapt our core technology so that we can fully tap into those things. So, so the cost aspect of it is not just, you know, we're not, we don't put the fingers at Kevin and say, do something. It's just all of us 
have to uh, you know embrace the new the new environment and make make optimal use out of it. Yeah, and, and Mark, if you allow me to make an observation, I think some of the things that were going on in the inter internet was people were starting to notice more and more job openings about cloud dev and Unreal Engine and got people a lot very excited about what the future holds uh, for <laughs> Unreal Engine. I don't know if you can comment or not about that, but that was definitely up there uh, in some of the chat rooms about uh, what's yet to come from Unreal Engine in the cloud. Uh, it's. I mean, it's no mystery. I mean, it's, you know, one is that level of work that we want to do on the engine to make it, you know, a, you know, a first class citizen on the cloud. We'll do a lot of work with AWS and other cloud providers on, you know, the equivalent of AMIs and all of that, you know, 40 gig, 40 gig, 40 gig, 40 gig uh, Windows instance is a monster in the cloud. I mean, which, you know, it's not, it's not an optimal use of what the cloud should be. So we do all of that work. I mentioned collaboration, uh, you know, our tools are multi-users. Um, interesting enough, the film people have embraced it more than the games people, but you can do collaborative level editing. And so we're working on really like making this a, a real push button solution. So the, the six of us could suddenly, you know, let's go, let's go do some work in the Unreal Engine together. And all of the data management, data replication problem that goes along with supporting this collaborative workflows, but multi-user is at the heart of what we do. And then you've seen the meta human creator. I mean, we have a lot of other things uh, that we could, again, when we when we look at what we can do with machine learning and game mechanics and real-time graphics, there's a lot of new application we have in mind, and they will be it will they will be better off on the cloud. So, so, so what you are seeing, what you what you've observed is the combination of all those things. So we did create a little bit of a, to be honest, of a specific team because people with a gaming background they're not cloud friendly by by default. And so we felt that we needed to create a little bit of a team. You know, we, we, we know about the cloud through the Fortnite effort, through our host party effort as well. So we kind of created a small team using talent from those teams to, to lead the way on, on what happens when we go cloud first. You know, what do we need to do to the engine when we think cloud first? Okay, to support collaboration, to support pixel streaming. I mean, delivering a content from the cloud is also something that's huge. It's a little bit impractical and expensive right now, but we have a lot of car configurators running off the cloud above and beyond all the gaming services. So, you know, the cloud is the way you make an interactive experience uh, independent of the, of the cloud device and predictable. And for marketers and retailers, it's hugely important. I mean, gamers want the maximum performance, but there are other markets where, you know, you reach out through all devices and cloud streaming uh, is the way you achieve this. So. You know, we have a lot of effort there and we don't, we enable a lot of partners to do, to do pixel streaming. And so yeah, thank you. So, uh, yeah, what's, what's again, what's, what intrigues and intrigues me and so fascinating about this industry is, is, you know, we're, we're as a consortium of, of people trying to, you know, all help and, you know, pioneers like Avita and other um, studios who've, you know, taken that step towards it. You know, we're, linked, we're learning together. I mean, Incredibuild is a classic example of a company that, you know, predominantly was there to accelerate dev processes. And then at one point when we saw, you know, the cloud as being another uh, factor, which we said about cost, you know, we looked at saying, wait a minute, we're, we're in that process level, we're in that virtualized layer. Um, you know, we also can help sort of coordinate and, and, and orchestrate some of the things that we're there anyway doing through uh, through our parallelization and distributing of things. Um, and really that's where the industry kind of took us towards like, hey, this this could be another value. And then started working with our partners uh, with AWS and Perforce and so forth to bring that together. So I think if I was to summarize this, this uh, virtual panel, I think this is the beginning of something beautiful, um, possibly something of a consortium uh, of us, you know, a call out for us to be more sort of as a as a group coming together to share best practices together uh, alongside helping um, some of our pioneers out there like Avita and others who are our are, are, are partners primarily uh, in this journey together. So for the time period that we have, we have four minutes left. I just want to be um, clear to that. So we're going to take some questions. Yeah, so we're going to have the Q&A portion of the session now. I sent, uh, I sent to you hi by uh, Teams. OK. We have a few questions uh, from the audience. 
Okay, let's check out some of these questions. And uh, Kevin, um, Brad, uh, Vita, any of you guys, if you find anything that's um, intriguing to you, um, pl please feel free as well. So the first one, um, how are different size studios addressing the cloud hurdle? Are their needs the same or different? So I think we talked a little bit about the different sizes. Uh, Avida, I think, represents. Avida, did you say you're you're considered more of a medium sized, the small medium? What what are the uh, the right? Uh... I, yeah, we're not small. We're about a hundred, so it's not it's not tiny. But um, it just depends on how many projects you have. I think actually going on like the larger larger projects, uh, larger teams require um, may have more projects simultaneously going. You need to worry about churning those you know, dev cycles out faster, making the builds come out quicker. Um, I can see that being uh, more of a issue for larger companies. Right, Excellent. and smaller companies would potentially be able to disrupt their build pipelines um, and iterate maybe faster. Uh, so their, their migration of a, a Perforce server um, you know, into AWS, even just as a replica or an edge server uh, and get developers on it, uh, just might be uh, quicker and easier for, for those smaller developers. But it's all, but in general, studios of any size can, can take small steps uh, to move some of their um, development and accelerate it. You know, even in Credibuild, getting a certain set of agents into Incredible Cloud and having a subset of developers, like you don't have to roll it out to everybody. Some use cases and roles make sense given like, you know, their internet connectivity, like Evita was mentioning before. Some, some users will be more, be able to take on these type of accelerators versus others. Yeah, yeah and I think what we've seen is, um is that there's definitely, when you get the larger of the AAA studios, they have a process, they have their infrastructure, and as they've had to move, it's okay, how do we map this, right? And can we be more efficient about it? So that was sort of one set of transition challenges, but it was pretty, it's straightforward, it's complex because they're dealing with a lot of scale. Um, the, the really the small indies, they've just kind of been probably doing this in the cloud anyways to start. Right, and they're starting to build their infrastructure. It's really the folks in the middle that, especially the ones that have kind of grown up during the last year or so, gone from, I've talked to a bunch of folks that have gone from 10 people to 200, much like Avita's you know, uh, size. And that's where a lot of challenges come in because they might not have started out having this massive IT infrastructure that knows how to do this and have had to grow pretty quickly, have had to do it all remote, all in the cloud, um, while at the same time defining their culture, their process, their you know end-to-end -end, you know uh, pipeline for building their games, so it's been a, a super challenge, and that's something that we're trying to take a lot of the lessons learned and help share that data with um, with the rest of our customer base. Because one thing I have found, which is really cool in the gaming industry, is a lot of the companies are very keen to share their tools and practices and processes, and are like, hey, we'll compete on our creative ability, right? Not every industry is like that, that, that we deal with. Uh, so it's actually really, really cool to see people sharing their tools and best practices and tips. Um, and we're actually looking to try to get some like more consortiums together to help people share and like rise the, rise, you know, rise the boats for everybody and let them compete on creativity, which is really cool. I can also say that um, <clears throat> when we're talking about the big ones, um, we see them, the difficulty is not with the bandwidth and the speeding time and the acceleration, rather it, how do we use cloud across 50 sites or 60, or 60, it could be, you know, in the US everything is okay, but if I have a studio with five engineers um, 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 with a different architecture, with different network and so on, how do I connect all of this to the cloud? Um, and this is where we see our customers struggle, the big ones. Yeah, thank you so much for that, everyone. Um, just be conscious of the time. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, this was fun, and I think it was very informative. And I do uh, thank all of you, really, for taking the time uh, to uh, join us, uh, both our esteemed panelists and uh, you viewers out there. Um, and there will be a recording. So if you feel like there's someone else out there who you think could benefit from this, uh, hopefully once you get that, you can share it with your uh, colleagues and friends. And until next time, everyone keep safe. Um, keep learning and uh, see you on the next virtual roundtable.
Thank you. Thanks for hosting. Thank you. Bye, everyone.